morning and thank you for joining the extended day ahead market working group two meeting. This meeting is related to the transmission commitment and congestion rent allocation topics. This is Christina Osborne from ISO stakeholder engagement group. I'll be providing support for the meeting and Deb Levine is the facilitator and Emily Hughes is the scribe for this working group. And then we also have Phil Pettengill who is the coordinator overseeing all three of the EDAM working groups. Uh, we are back to our regular meeting cadence after scaling back to one meeting per week for each of the work groups over the past couple of weeks. This working group meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 11. Um, and again, you can find the participation details for the meetings on ISO's public calendar. These working groups are intended to be collaborative and we do encourage participants to share ideas and perspectives during these meetings. So if at any time you have a question or would like to make a comment, uh, please raise your hand and the facilitator, Deb, will call on you. And just a reminder to please state your name and affiliation first so that others know who is speaking. The working group meetings are recorded. Uh, we do post the video files out on the corresponding working group web pages, along with the other related materials. Uh, please request permission from the ISO before reprinting these transcriptions. And stakeholders are welcome to present their perspectives at these meetings, so if you are interested, Please submit a request using the inquiry link located on the resources slide at the end of this presentation, and the facilitator will reach out to you to coordinate the logistics. So for today's agenda, Deb's going to start off with reviewing the objectives of the meeting, and then she's going to turn it over to Milos Fasonic from ISO's policy team to discuss EDAM transfer transmission rights, and then Deb uh, will close with a review of the topics for the next meeting. So with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Deb. Thanks so much, Christina. Good morning, everyone. So today's objective, as we said um, at the last meeting, is to go through the examples of the transfer of transmission rights for bucket one and bucket two between the EDAM BAAs. And then we also have examples of transmission transactions between bucket one and bucket two which will be from the non-EDAM to the EDAM BAAs, which in, in essence are imports and exports um, from the non-EDAM BAAs. And then to the extent we've got some time at the end, we'll start into bucket two and have a discussion about bucket two and its compensation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Milos. Thank you. Presentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. Good morning, everybody. Let me see if we can sh if I can share my screen. Okay. Let me know. Is that is that visible? Yes. Yes. All right. Perfect. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us for the discussion today. Um, let me just start with with a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover in these slides. And, and I recognize in the discussion of the work group, we've, we've jumped around a little bit between buckets and, and other concepts. But we wanted to come back to the buckets really to illustrate and define them further, make sure there's a common understanding, at least, as to the structure of these as they've been thought about. Um, this is where we left off, I think, a couple of weeks back when we said we're going to work on certain examples and further define what these buckets mean and as the source of transmission that's made available to support EDAM transfers. And I think based off of uh, some offline outreach as well to the ISO and other discussions, I think there will be a benefit of walking through these in, in a bit further detail. And so today's focus, at least in this presentation, will be primarily on bucket one and bucket two, and then we'll come bucket one and bucket three, and then we'll come back to bucket two transmission, which is a bit more complex uh, and has certain additional nuances than I think these two. But these buckets represent the premise that the EIM entities put forward back in 2019 as to how transmission across their system, across interfaces, interchanges between EDAM BAs will be made available to the EDAM to optimize and ultimately to derive the benefits of EDAM transfers. Um, these buckets are also consistent with the common design principles that were put forward as a starting point, and they provide an overview, um, uh, and I think the e the EI amenities, I think Kathy's presentation early on in the working group provided an overview to the working group um, of these different buckets at a higher level. And we wanted to go back now through these with the benefit of some of the prior discussion to identify if there are any gaps or close any gaps, uh, make sure that, again that there's a common understanding on these concepts. 
uh, again, the intent is to gain a common understanding on the type of transmission and the source of that transmission that's made available to support these buckets. Um, and, and the intent is really today not to discuss how the market optimizes these. Um, the focus also uh, of today's discussion is how that transmission is made available at interchanges or interfaces between EDA and BA to support those transfers. We're not discussing internal transmission at this stage. That will be uh, coming up in a subsequent discussion. Uh, and also, I'll note one last thing is that in a subsequent discussion, we're also going to discuss um, PISO transmission and how does the ISO make transmission available uh, to the EDAM in the context of the bucket to support those EDAM transfers. So with that context, let me jump into the presentation. and. By all means, feel free to ask questions as we go throughout. I may need to rely on some of my colleagues or um, other EI amenities that may want to jump in and provide additional context or clarification. Uh, but the intent is really today to, to gain some common understanding around these buckets and close out any gaps uh, that, that may arise. So starting off with uh, bucket one transmission characteristics. Um, these consist of transmission rights at transfer points or interchanges uh, between EDAM balancing authority areas. And ultimately, this transmission supports uh, uh, the demonstration of resource efficiency. Uh, the, these transmission rights or the source of these transmission rights can be under the OAT or the Open Access Transmission Tariff, or there could potentially be some legacy agreements that parties may have that are free OAT arrangements uh, that may provide for certain transmission rights uh, across transfer points between EDAM areas that uh, allow for optimization of EDAM transfers. Now, the starting point here is, is that these consist of firm or conditional firm transmission rights or this concept of otherwise highly reliable uh, transmission rights. And, you know, these could be point-to-point -point or network integration transmission service rights that provide uh, that transmission across those transfer points. It could be long-term or it could be short-term. And, and I think we'll have subsequent discussions ultimately on the mechanics of you know, how some level of detail, not necessarily going into too much detail, but ultimately of how those transmission uh, rights are made available to the EDAM, you know, if they're short-term or long-term. But the intent behind these being firm or conditional firm or this concept of otherwise highly reliable is that uh, they support reliable and dependable EDAM transfers. EI amenities rely on um, on EDAM transfers to avoid committing certain units and you know on an efficient more efficiently and, and serve load. And so it's important that uh, the EDAM transfers be supported by highly reliable and dependable transmission. And that's where this concept of firm transmission, which has the highest curtailment priority, um, or the conditional firm transmission, which just to make sure we're, we're all understanding what this concept of conditional firm means. This is transmission rights that are uh, firm for the vast majority of the time, but, you know, they may be uh, slightly lower priority, which is, you know, highest non-firm, 6NN priority, um, as defined under certain contracts, either for a number of hours in the year or under certain conditions, but the vast majority of the time, these are firm transmission right. And then there's this concept of otherwise highly reliable transmission that I think we can we can discuss a bit further as we go uh, through these examples. And then the amount of bucket one transmission that's made available to the EDAM ultimately supports those transfers uh, between EDAM balancing authority areas and, and derives those benefits. Uh, we're talking only about bucket one at this point, but you know, we'll talk at a later point on bucket two transmission that further uh, provides additional uh, transmission across those transfer points on a voluntary basis as we've talked about it thus far. But bucket one is that initial transfer transmission that supports uh, the resource efficiency uh, demonstration uh, across, uh, across those transfer points. And then we also talked about that bucket one transmission, uh, there's not a further usage rate compensation for use of that bucket one transmission to support EDAM transfers because that transmission has uh, already been paid for. Um, you know, these bucket one, the transmission rights that have been made available under bucket one, though, would be eligible for 
uh, a congestion uh, rent or congestion revenue allocation similar to bucket two transmission. So those are some of the initial characteristics of, uh, of bucket one transmission. We'll illustrate that, look to illustrate that in, in the next uh, few examples, but I do wanna come back, keep these characteristics as my, in mind as, as we go through these examples and let's tease out, are there any nuances, any questions, any gaps potentially that we may consider in, in how these transmission rights apply uh, in the context of certain arrangements or you know, that, uh, that may be supporting resource efficiency. So let's start with, a... oh, sorry, go ahead. That's the same, Milos, just um, to make sure no one has any questions at this time. Um, we don't show any hands, but I just want to make sure if anybody wanted to ask a question, they had the opportunity before you started in on the examples. Uh, Connie Westcott. Operator, sure, you I'll open? unmute the line. Yes. Uh, you'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. After that, please proceed with your question. Your line has been unmuted. Thank you. Connie Wiestat, Nevada Commission. I, I still have, I have a question about the reservation of, of network, trans, network transmission because I'm, this is probably discussed by you all before and I just don't know. It is only a load serving trans, transmission service, the amount of, trans, of the transmission reservation is never greater than the load being served at the time it's being served. So how, how is it given up to EDAM when that is the transmission that's been reserved for that network customer by a network resource to serve its load? Thank you, Connie. Uh, maybe maybe let's uh, let's use it in the context of this example on slide four, and then uh, you know I'll invite you know other EI amenities to to provide any additional context. But let me try let me give it a shot first, and then others can jump in. So, in the context of this scenario here, I think this is the, the more straightforward scenario where you have two adjacent EDAM entities here. I mean, EDAM entity A and EDAM entity B, and uh, you know, this generator here you know, could be owned by the load serving entity or by the entity here in, in uh, entity B, but EDAM entity B wants effectively to use this generator here and the capacity associated with it for its resource efficiency uh, evaluation. Um, and it can do that. It's an, it's an import, it's a transfer across EDAM BAs, um, and it can count towards, towards its resource efficiency evaluation. Now, I'm trying to play around with this a little bit, but you know the transmission rights here uh, would be, you know, let's say, to deliver this generator to to EDAM entity B. Um, uh, this party has point-to-point -point transmission service across EDAM entity A to get it to the border with EDAM entity B, and then uh, it's a, it's a designated resource for EDAM entity B. So this would be NIST uh, transmission service. Uh, okay. So let's say this is the this is the, the this is the transmission reservation scenario. The uh, this is a designated resource for EDAM entity B. They have point to point transmission rights to deliver it from the generator to to the border with EDAM entity B, and then from the border of EDAM entity B, they're delivering it on network integration transmission service. Uh, to to the entity uh, to the entity B load here, uh, we would envision that under the bucket one transmission, if this generation is being utilized for the resource efficiency evaluation, that 100 megawatts across these transfer points is the the transmission ultimately that's being made available to support uh, EDAM transfers. So I, I don't know, Connie, if this kind of illustrates that scenario, but you know, the intent is not necessarily that, because you can have, you can have, uh, in order to serve that network load of, of that load serving entity, I think in your scenario, you can have internal resources serving it and then resources that are brought in across other areas. What we're talking about here is, is transmission of those transfer points between EDAM entity areas 
and they would be bringing along only that amount that they're using, you know, for showing that resource for resource efficiency purposes on a on a daily basis. So in this case, if they're trying to use this 100 megawatt resource uh, for resource efficiency for that particular day, they would be effectively making available 100 megawatts across this transfer point uh, to support EDAM transfers and optimization in the market. Let me let me pause here and, and maybe see if any of the EI amenities, I don't know if Kathy, Kevin, or David maybe want to correct me or, or add anything to, to what I just noted in Connie's scenario in particular. And I don't know, Deb, if you have a, you, you probably have more visibility on, on if somebody has their hand raised or not. Yeah, I do. So, Connie, does that make sense? Um, it, it, it doesn't to me because um, how that resource gets to the, uh, the interface um, is, is important, but the amount of transmission reserved via network integrated transmission service at the interface is never any greater than the load it's going to serve. And the only customers we have that have ex resources external to the BA are, are, not, are, not, are unbundled retail transmission customers or municipalities that are serving their load with resources external. That, that doesn't mean they have, if they, that they have to be an, network integration transmission, a fixed amount of transmission reservation. They only have as much transmission as they need to serve their load. They're, they're paying for it on a basis of a coin, monthly coincident peak. And so it's, you can't, and they need that transmission to serve their load. So how is it released to others? Well, it's, Milos, you want to answer that? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me see if, if, if this helps, Connie. You know, I, I think I think you're correct that the amount of transmission service that's ultimately reserved to serve that workload of a load serving entity is you know equal to to the amount of of that load. Now you can have internal or external resources serving that uh, serving that load. In this case, though, you you know you have to have Generally, you have to have designated network resources to serve that load. In this scenario, if you have an external designated resource that is outside of the EDAM entity area B, and EDAM entity B wants to use that resource on a particular day to demonstrate its resource efficiency, what we're saying is the amount of transmission associated with this particular designated network resource that they're bringing along across this transfer point, that's the amount of transmission that's made available to the EDAM for optimization. You may have other internal generators here that are serving your network load, you know, and that qualifies for your resource efficiency evaluation. Uh, what we're talking about with bucket one transmission is, is focused only on transmission. What transmission are you bringing in a transfer point between EDAM BAs? Not as much internal transition, transmission that we care about is, is what transmission are you bringing in at the transfer point you know, on, on a particular day, you can have the load being served solely by internal resources, you know, but if they choose to bring in on a particular day for demonstrating resource efficiency to rely on a resource that's external to the BA that they need to bring in as a designated resource, what we're saying is they would be bringing in the transmission across these transfer points as well under bucket one transmission to support uh, those transfers. So, so this allowed. is looking at a resource by resource basis that you're demonstrating in resource efficiency. And is that resource that you're demonstrating, is it, if it's outside of the BA, is it bringing transmission with it uh, to support EM transfers? But if it's the only, if, if you're serving your load external to the BA and you don't have an internal network resource, these customers are not yeah. allowed to buy any resource that's owned by NV Energy. So they don't have any internal network resources. Yeah. Um, so the only thing they have to serve their load is that transmission and they, yeah. they're going to need it. And it's not 100 megawatts. Um, it, can't, it can't be, the amount of transmission cannot be more than the load. 
doesn't have anything to do with the yeah. to point 100. When it comes in, they only get the amount equal to their load. Anyway, I'll I'll let you go on. I'm I'm sorry to belabor that point. Yeah, and I think I think we have maybe Kathy or somebody in the queue here that maybe can provide the, the perspective from the EIM entity to deal with with these transmission rights. Yeah, Kathy or Dave Rubin, do you want to jump in? Let me unmute uh, Kathy's line. Thank you. Or Dave Rubin just jump in too. Okay. Um, may I know whose line should I unmute first? Uh, Dave Rubin. Okay, sure. Please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. See, and I was going to say to unmute Kathy's first, but <laughs> no, I, I mean, Connie's point is an important one, and, and it's one that I know we've been discussing as part of this effort. And clearly, as we work on an EDAM potential design, we also in the back of our mind would be thinking what changes we might be doing to the oats. So you had discussions yesterday about resource efficiency and WSPP schedule C's and, and maybe, you know, as part of an EDAM where there really is increased regional reliance, are we going to sort of tighten up that it has to be on firm all the way from source to the, the border requirements? Uh, even beyond what we see in the, the WSPP Schedule C requirements out of FERC today. Similar here, I think what Connie's getting at, um, let's say we have a, a network customer, a municipal in our, our northern system, um, they'll give us a 10-year plan, and let's say the 10-year plan totals 100 megawatts. On a day-to-day -day basis, that, that, that plan is probably off of their summer peak, and so you know, most times in October, or January, or February, they're not going to be scheduling an import at 100. They may be down around 50. Uh, and so clearly the, the 50 that they're scheduling for that hour and that day is bucket one. Um, and they haven't, you know, they pay for it as Connie indicated on a load ratio share. So the, the question I think that we've, you know, been, you know, struggling with, but certainly exploring in this group is, well, what do we do with the non-scheduled 50 megawatts that has been set aside? We can't sell it as firm ATC because um, that customer can both increase their schedule from 50 to, you know, 60. Uh, potentially if the weather is hotter than they planned that day. Uh, but then also there are times of the years where they might need the full 100. Uh, and so um, there's sort of two parts of that, which is how do we make that additional megawatts that aren't being scheduled at that hour, at that time for that customer's bucket one available? Uh, or are we setting it aside for intraday changes because we don't want them to cause congestion that would then potentially be an uplift to other customers? Um, or, you know, can we make more of it available in a way, and is it going to be in bucket one? Or does it then become more what it is today? We would sell it on a non-firm basis, and then the revenue for that non-firm sale would be used as a revenue credit to customers. Does that 50 that hasn't been scheduled become something else? Does it become bucket three, for example? Um, I think those are, Connie, maybe the, the questions you were getting at. Yeah, can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, yes, because that brings up the other point. There's an assumption that that transmission has been paid for. It, it has not the, any excess. If they, if, if in their plan they they thought that they may have a peak load at some point of 100 megawatts and they have a network resource equal to or greater than their load, um, that they have they, they have transmission reservation, but the only reservation they actually have is equal to their load and they're never paying for transmission in excess of their load. So if there were that, say, 50 extra megawatts of transmission that was there so they can actually serve at peak, 
that hasn't been paid for. You know, I completely agree with you. It, it, yeah. It's it's not the way point to point is. So it's it's is load ratio share, uh, and that's why you know treating it as non-firm today has been important for us. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to hold you guys up on this. No, no, no. I mean, I, I think this is raising a good question, but let, let me ask them for a clarification, maybe from you, David, and others as well. Yeah, I'm thinking of bucket one. I, I think the ultimate question is, how are you using that resource for demonstrating resource sufficiency in the day ahead time frame? Um, yeah, that, that ties it ultimately to bucket one. In your scenario, David. You know, if they're only planning and operating that resource at 50 megawatts, are you using it as at 50 megawatts for your resource efficiency uh, evaluation, or are you using it at some other amount? And, and I would think that if it is at 50 megawatts, then you know, then for this particular hour, you'd be bringing in, you know, 50 megawatts of that that transmission right. rather than you know whatever the full amount of the designated resource is. Right, and, and I think we're all saying the same thing about. Uh, amount physically being scheduled is clearly bucket one. Um, I think what Connie is teeing up, which I think is very important, is how do you yeah. handle that other 50? Uh, and, you know, the exactly. assumption has always been that bucket one uh, and bucket two have been previously paid for. Um, but I do think she's spot on in saying that this really hasn't been. Uh, and so uh, to that extent, is it more you know, beneficial to, to treat that uh, as a bucket three, for example, subject to that same rate, because in our case, our non-firm rate and our firm rate are the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, fair, fair point. And I think, I think, you know, once we get as well to bucket two, we'll need to have that, you know, I think similar discussion you know, it might be slightly different than this NIST question, but I think, what happens to unscheduled transmission you have under bucket two, you know, people that make transmission affirmatively available to the EDAM, but then you have also unscheduled transmission. What happens to that unscheduled transmission? Is it made available to the EDAM or not? Um, and, and I think in that context, I think we can have this discussion as well on in the NIST context, context, if you have a designated resource for 100, but for a particular hour, it's used, being used at 50 megawatts, you know, what about the other 50 you know, as, as you're teeing it up here? You know, does that fall maybe into bucket two or maybe as you're noting it into bucket three? But, but I wanna just a common understanding that on, on bucket one, in the context of designated resources, and then let's take it in the context of point to point, if we're talking about a designated network resource, if that designated network resource is designated at 100 megawatts, uh, but on any particular hour, you know, you're, for the resource sufficiency, you're envisioning operating at 50 or you're offering it at 50, I would envision that you would be bringing those 50 megawatts in lieu of the 100 that that resource may have been designated at. Uh, do we have, David, common understanding, at least on that concept in the context of bucket one? Is that how it was envisioned? or how you're envisioning it? Yeah, I mean, again, I think everything that's, that's physically has been planned to come in uh, to meet that load is bucket one. Um, and, you know, and clearly one change that we've talked about with regard to an EDAM that goes beyond that physical schedule under the oat construct would be the concept of bid range. So now you are reserving the, you're, or you're bidding the 100 um, for optimization purposes. You've bought uh, the, or, or let me go back, you reserve the 50 now for optimization purposes. You still have the, the point to point reservation to the border. And then you've got the, the planned import. So there's going to be the assumption that it is going to be either a physical delivery the way it is under the up today or a bid range delivery. Uh, and then again, we've, we've got to ma match it up to the, the actual load forecast for that day as, um, as you were discussing with Connie earlier. Yeah. 
Okay, and I noted here kind of the, the, the lingering question that I think we can keep in mind, especially as we get to bucket three and bucket two at a future discussion. Uh, not opiating. <laughs> Spell check. Um, okay, and then you know, so that's the, that's the example of designate a network resource then scenario. Um, whatever the resource is ultimately being operating at or, or being offered in for the resource sufficiency evaluation, um, it is that amount of. If this is an external designated network resource that is being delivered to EDAM and TB, it is that amount uh, that it's being offered at that is bucket one transmission that's being brought with it, which may be different than the amount that the resource may be designated. You know, it can be designated at 100, you know, to serve load for EDAM and TB, but really it's for a particular hour it's being offered at 50 because it plans to operate at 50. It's that 50 that it would bring in. As bucket one, and the lingering question is, what happens to that other 50 in the context of the other buckets? Can that be made available as bucket two? Can that be made available in some way as uh, bucket three? Uh, but I think the common understanding here is whatever that resource is being offered at for resource sufficiency purposes, it is that amount of transmission that it's bringing with it. Similarly, if uh, similarly if that generator for some reason, you know, it's, it's it's an external generator it is you know, is being offered at, at 100 megawatts, but it may have point-to-point -point transmission across both segments, you know, to bring it into EDAM entity B. You know, it's at 100 megawatts uh, that it's being offered at, that it would be bringing, be expected to bring in bucket one transmission with it across that transfer point. And again, this scenario is limited to uh, between two EDAM BAs where, where there's transfers between those two EDAM adjacent BAs adjacent to each other. Okay. Milos, we have a question from Tong Wu. Tong, go ahead. Hey, go ahead, uh, this is, is Tong unmuted. Wu from WAPA. This is Tong Wu from WAPA. I'm struggling with the concept of a transfer point. Um, I, I just need uh, some perspective. I probably looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, my understanding is uh, transmission has to do with uh, a branch group or a path. For example, let's assume that here entity A is uh, BPA and uh, entity B is ISO. So uh, here let's say we're talking about the transmission on PEGI from Malin to Round Mountain. So Malin is in Oregon, Round Mountain is in California. So we're really talking about a segment of the transmission. And uh, ISO published the capacity as PEGI on ISO's OASIS. Uh, is this transfer point equivalent to that branch group? Or this is just Malin, the you know, scheduling point itself? Um, so here, when we have this generator uh, going from somewhere inside entity A to the boundary, are we talking about the transmission from, say, Zhangde to Malin, or somewhere to Malin? Uh, and here, this segment from the boundary to load, are we talking about from Malin to the ISO, inside ISO, some point in the ISO? Uh, I, I, I cannot relate the concept of transfer point to a transmission. So if somebody brings to the table transmission capacity, it's not a point, it's a you know branch group, the capacity on a branch group. Can you help me to relate the concepts? Yeah, George Angelides, would you like to take that question? Operator, could you open up George's line? Sure. Please go ahead, the line is unmuted. Uh, thank you, Operator. Good morning, this is George Angelinis with the ISO. Um, Tom, you're right, uh, essentially what you're saying here, you have an internal generator in, okay, let's let's say EDAM Entity A, let's say it's BPA for the sake of this uh, example here. And, and then uh, that segment is, is going from the generator to 
to Malin. And then you, what we call as a transfer point is really um, where we um, represent the transfer between, in this case, BPA and ISO uh, at the Malin intertie. And this transfer is represented with a pair of uh, energy transfer system resources, those EPSRs, so on each side. One is, uh, is an export from BPA, the other is the Im import into the ISO. Um, so these are two resources on each side of that intertie, of the Malin intertie. And then the, the portion that goes to the load is internal ISO transmission. So it's just a, a simple representation in this diagram, what we call a transfer point here is really that intertie between uh, BPA and ISO, and we model the transfer between these two BAAs with this uh, pair of resources on each side of that intertie, like we do it in EIM. Would that um, um, provide a, an answer to your question? Uh, yeah, uh, kind of. Um, now, uh, I, I was Hong, really confused. Yeah. Hong, another way to think about it is that you've got boundaries between the balancing authority areas that are defined points. And so this transfer point is the boundary between, in George's example, BPA and the CAISO. So the transfer point is Malin. That's what Okay, the, the transfer is. point is Malin, okay. But the uh, transmission capacity is not at the Malin, either from somewhere to Malin or from Malin to the ISO. So when we have these uh, P, uh, point to point 100 megawatt, point to point 100 megawatt on these two segments, these are the capacity for different transmission paths. Is that correct? I think in this example, generically, this so internal transmission and BPA to get to Malin and internal transmission in ISO getting from Malin to the load. Yeah. Um, and but, you know, the packet one transfer is really at the Malin intertie. That's where the, um, the transfer schedule is, uh, is declared, right. right? So it's not different than the IM. So here let's say I am trying to get my transmission to accomplish this transfer from the G to L here, okay? So, I, you know, um, one interpretation is that I just need – capacity on Pecky from Malin to uh, Round Mountain or somewhere in the ISO. That's all I need to do. Uh, these two legs, actually, they, rep they represent the same transmission path. That's Pecky. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that I need transmission, say, from John Day to Malin and then from Malin to Round Mountain. Okay? So these are two separate transmission segments. And uh, in James Lin's example, that confused me a lot because uh, it seems uh, the uh, the transmission uh, you know limits on the north uh, on the north side and on the south side uh, they they're mingled as if they are for the same transmission path. Uh, but here maybe these are two sep separate transmission paths. But I still don't know. So you know there are two interpretations in my mind. If you can tell me which one. Uh, is correct, that that will be helpful. Uh, Tom, for the resource efficiency evaluation specifically, we're not looking at the internal transmission in a BAA from some generator to the boundary or from the boundary to some load. We're really looking at the, at the transfer, at the bucket one transfer declaration that says that I'm going to use let's say 100 megawatt of bucket one transfer, energy transfer between EDAM entity A and EDAM entity B, and that's all we need to know. Uh, this, the particulars of the underlying contract, if there is one in place that requires transmission from the generator to the border, from the border to the load, and these details are not relevant for the RSC because the RSC is performed at the BAA level. So although this example shows the entire chain here, um, for the resource efficiency evaluation, we only care, we only need to know that there is a 100 megawatt bucket one transfer that is released between EDAM entity A and EDAM entity B, and this is sufficient for us to essentially transfer uh, 
100 megawatts of demand forecast from entity B to entity A to perform the resource efficiency evaluation for these two BAAs, all right? Okay, so now let me repeat what I understood. So basically what you're saying, uh, a transfer point, really here, we're talking about the branch group. So in this case, when we talk about Malin, so when we say transfer point and all these numbers, these capacity, these numbers are for PECI. So this transfer point is PECI and no other transmission segment is PECI only, is that right? Yes, and I would like to go a little level, uh, one level higher. It's really the intertie, and I want to say a logical intertie. It doesn't really have to be 100% a physical intertie. In EIM, we sometimes uh, group interties and we form a logical intertie um, that connects uh, uh, BAAs, if, particularly if there are multiple physical interties and the, the schedule that we're uh, considering here, the transfer. Um, you know, it, it could be uh, using a generic logical intertie, like this is happening with BPA, for example. We have um, logical interties between BPA and other uh, BAAs in the Northwest that are part of the EIM. So, see it as a logical construct. In, in this particular example we're talking about, yes, it will be the Malin intertie. Uh, but in general, it could be any logical intertie that we uh, define uh, between uh, two BAAs, and this could translate down to be a group of interties that, you know, they could be in parallel, and they have a scheduling limit over the entire group. So um, let's let's say that you have both scenarios. I see, I see. Okay, so basically here it shows two segments, two legs. Actually, we're just talking about one interface. There are no two legs, just one, actually. The yeah. transfer point yeah, itself it, is it, one. Yeah, it's a good word to use what you said, interface. It's really a transmission interface, um, a logical transmission interface between two uh, BAAs where the schedule is, is declared and calculated later on by the market. When you tag it, you tag it on an intertie, of course, and, and that, mm -hmm. you know, it could, yeah. could, be, could be a logical intertie too yeah. in the system. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We're not talking about a chain of uh, uh, transmission legs. We're just talking about that particular leg, leg segment crosses these two EDAM entities. Correct. For RFC purposes, that's all that we care for, and this is what the transfer is. It's, okay. it's uh, well, the thank energy you, or capacity transfer I got it. between two BS at the time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, George. George, let me ask a question, follow-up question to that. Doesn't it, well, yes, we care about the transfer um, at the transfer point being available, but doesn't it presume that the entity who's proving their resource efficiency has the transmission to get from the generator to the transfer point and from the transfer point to the load? Yes, this is an inherent assumption um, yeah. Then. Okay. So, because we always assume that internal transmission has been made available for any kind of declaration of these transfers and for the resource efficiency evaluation purpose. So, we take it as granted. Once it's declared, the part from the, the transmission from the generation to the border and from the border to, to the load it is assumed to be uh, there. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. All right, that's all we have for questions at this time. All right, thank you, and and, and good discussion, Tong and, and and George, and hopefully that that was a bit clearer. Within a lose, people, I think I think the example that Tong was referencing was was a bit more complex, and and this may vary from EDAM entity to EDAM entity depending on how the interfaces between BAs. You know, there are different nuances at different points, but like Deb, I think brought us back to ultimately the point is that. Yeah, there's the, the, the EDAM will optimize the transfers based on the amount of transmission here that, that's available, but ultimately behind it, as parties are showing the resource efficiency evaluation, you know, they're demonstrating they have the transmission from ultimately the generator to their BA uh, that, that provides some transfer capacity across those interfaces between two balancing authority areas. So let me let me go to to a 
Yeah, a, a, a different, more sim, sim, simplistic example, but just uh, between a non-EDAM entity and an EDAM entity, just to make it clear that, that there's no bucket one transmission that's made available uh, between uh, a non-EDAM entity BA and an EDAM entity BA. The, the EDAM entity balancing authority area may potentially rely upon a generator outside of the EDAM balancing authority area to meet its resource sufficiency. Uh, but because the interface is not across uh, two EDAM balancing authority areas, the market is not optimizing the transmission of that interface, and so they're not bringing any, any further transmission for optimization um, to support EDAM transfers. Uh, you know, this, we'll talk about intertie bidding at, at a later point here soon, uh, but, you know, the, the, the EDAM could potentially, depending on how we uh, address that issue and, and, and address intertie bidding, to the extent that generator, this generator is economically offered, the EDAM could potentially optimize it, but the expectation, I think the more straightforward approach is that if, if EDAM entity BAA um, has a contract with an external generator that's located in a non-EDAM entity area, they could use that for the resource efficiency, be self-scheduled. They wouldn't be necessarily bringing any additional bucket one transmission to the table for EDAM transfer optimization because these are this is an interface that, that's between a non-EDAM entity and an EDAM entity. So let me pause here, at least on this concept as well, uh, to make sure that there's this common understanding of what happens in this scenario of a generator that is in a non-EDAM entity area that's being used to demonstrate sufficiency for the EDAM entity area. And because these are not uh, adjacent EDAM entities, there's no bucket one transmission that is being brought uh, along, uh, along here. Milos, it would just be an import into the EDAM BAA to serve that load for the resource adequacy, efficiency? For the resource efficiency, yeah. Resource efficiency, okay. All right, um, does anyone have any questions on this one? I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, Steve Greenleaf. Go ahead, your line is unmuted. Yeah, uh, thanks, Milos and Deb. Um, quick question on this, um, and if you can relate it back to, once again, KISO, just goes back to my much earlier questions about, for example, somebody utilizing, like us, knob rights to satisfy import RA obligations into the KISO. So I thought the previous response was that would effectively be bucket one, but now you're saying, well, I guess it depends on it. Assume Bonneville isn't a EDAM entity. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if Bonneville's not an ADAM entity, we're importing knob, utilizing knob rights to satisfy import RA obligations. That's just a tie point. It's not a interaction. It's not a bucket one transmission because it's not between ADAM entities. But if Bonneville was an ADAM entity, we would still be using, of course, this is, I think, right? Bucket two transmission to satisfy our import RA obligations. I don't know. I'm a little confused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think I think Stephen, you're getting at you know, I, I think more in the context of the ISO. How does the how does the bucket apply in the context of ISO transmission? And I'd like, if possible, to defer that discussion. You know, I think we'll discuss it here in up in an upcoming meeting, probably two or three meetings from now. Um, yeah. But but I, I think you know, there's, there's a different nuance here with the ISO where we don't necessarily have you know a robust transmission reservation process that things fit neatly into into the context of the bucket. Uh, we'll have a discussion on on how does the ISO make transmission available consistent with these buckets um, later, and, and it's a bit more of a nuanced discussion. What I want to do um, 
kind of focus yeah, the discussion fine. today that's was fine. between EMA. Yeah. But yeah, see, you know, that's, that's a good thought. So, and that, and, and, <laughs> that's fine. That's a good, I'll, I'll, a good scenario. Okay. Thank you. In a good scenario, keep it, and, and um, you know we'll look to I think preempt it maybe even at, at the future discussion and use some some of that context with with some examples to tease it out because it is a bit more complex and a bit more nuanced how to be uh, the concept of these buckets applies to ISO transmission. Okay, understand. Thanks. To the Milos, maybe you could expand to the extent that you have, um, let's say uh, uh, BPA and the EDAM entity is PAC, um, and BPA is not an EDAM entity. In that instance, wouldn't it just be an import into the EDAM to serve the load? That's right. That's right. Yeah, and 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 we'll talk about more a bit about intertype bidding at a future point. But yeah, it would be an import. You know, likely self-scheduled. Um, and there will be no, but the good concept here is that there's no bucket one transmission being brought to the table because this is transmission at, trans, uh, at interfaces between a non EDAM BA and an EDAM BA. Right. They can, they can so still we, use it for resource sufficiency. It just says that there's no additional bucket one transfer that's being tra transmission that's being brought to the table. Right, because we can't optimize that between a non EDAM BAA and an EDAM BAA. That's right. Okay. All right. Um, next question is from Rowan Chatterjee. Hear me? Please go ahead. Yeah. Hey, this is Rowan Chatterjee from Pacific Corp. Um, I had a quick follow-up question on that concept of um, a non-EDAM entity um, serving an EDAM BA load, and in this case, you know, going with that DPA example, you know, if Pacific Corp is using its vulnerable transmission rights to serve its load, I get that those um, vulnerable rights are not going to be available for the market optimization. That makes sense to me. But what I was trying to understand was, will the market have visibility of the, the concept that you know a certain amount of Pacific Corp's load is will be served by a by a generator in a non EDAM entity, and therefore you know it could be sort of a schedule from a non EDAM BA to the EDAM BA. I'm just wondering if the market will have at least that visibility. It may not need the transmission to be available for market optim optimization, but I'm just trying to understand and get a sense of. Is there going to be any visibility to the market that the load is, um, a portion of the load is being served from a generator that resides in a non EDAM entity? Thank you for that. And, and maybe, Deb, we, if George is available, maybe we can see if, if he can give a sense of how the market would see that and, and you know, the relevance of that visibility. George, would you like to answer that question? The line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, so is, is the question on how the market will see the transfer, this bucket one transfer we're talking about? Just yeah, want to make sure. Yeah, the question is, is how would the market know that there's a uh, resource efficiency transfer from a non EDAM BAA to an EDAM load. Okay, then we're not talking about the bucket one transfer. If it, the, the transfers are only between uh, EDAM BAAs, so we're talking about, uh, let's say, an import uh, at the boundary of, um, of the EDAM uh, market footprint. So this is an intertie between a non-EDAM BAA and an EDAM BAA where we have uh, schedules. Um, let's, I'm going to talk about self-schedules until we open up the issue of intertie bidding for discussion. So that schedule is uh, submitted uh, at a resource that we uh, register uh, specifically for that purpose at the boundary of the EDAM market footprint in the same way like what we do for EIM. 
And it could be either a system resource registered in the master file or uh, an intertype transaction which doesn't require a registration uh, if it's only for energy. Um, and uh, we will consider this in the resource efficiency evaluation as if it was an internal resource to the EWAAA, to the EWAA in this example. So uh, let's say if it's a self-scheduled, then obviously it meets some of the load in that uh, BAA. So that in that way, it will be just like an internal resource serving load for that BAA for the purpose of the resource efficiency evaluation. Is, is this uh, uh, satisfactory answer here to the question? I think so. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Deb, you may be on mute. I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have the next question from Jeff Spires. Please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Thanks. Good morning. It's Jeff Spires with PowerX. Uh, Milos, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Oh, great. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say I appreciate backing it up a level and, and putting together some examples like this that are a little bit more narrow and, and trying to just talk at a higher level about what bucket one is. I think this is um, this is useful and, and helps address, um, I think, you know, just some of the complexities here. If we can kind of start at a more simple look. So I appreciate you putting this together. Um, somewhat related, I think, to uh, the comment that we just heard from Pacific Core. Um, I think what I would suggest is that for on the previous slide, when you're looking at transfers between two EDAM BAAs, that that would, uh, I think that the CAISO should contemplate two subcategories here, um, transmission that can be optimized, uh, basically the, the bucket one that I think we're all talking about, but also another category of transmission that can't be optimized. Um, and the reason I say that is I think that um, there could be either transmission contracts or uh, resources or other reasons that an entity might be bringing in an external resource into their system to meet resource efficiency, but um, that transmission can't be re-dispatched or reused for another purpose. Um, and, you know, one example could even just be that if you say you had a third BA and the resource was actually going from a non-EDAM non area wheeling across the EDAM entity into area B, um, even though it's at the same interface between those two EDAM entities, uh, that transaction might not be optimized. So I think that would be a useful addition to these scenarios. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate it, Jeff, and, and, and thanks for that distinction. Um, you know, I, I think I think that's a fair point. Go ahead. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I elaborate a little bit on this, and I think I mentioned that uh, in a previous call uh, several weeks ago. Um, so all the transmission that is, is released um, is, is, of course, optimizable in IFM, including those bucket one transfers, uh, that we use in the resource efficiency evaluation. After the resource efficiency evaluation is concluded and we go into IFM, um, that transmission that was released under the bucket, bucket one transfer, now it can be optimized in the IFM to be used in the most efficient way that makes sense optimally. So, for example, even if it is a bucket one transfer for capacity, let's say, in balance reserve up, uh, the market may decide that it is um, more optimal to use it for energy, and it will do so. Um, there is, however, uh, the uh, the case that uh, we don't want some of that being optimized, and I think this is probably what uh, Jeff was suggesting here. And I did mention that um, for uh, capacity uh, transfers for ancillary services, um, the because we will not optimize ancillary services on day one with EDAM. We, we just wanted to uh, reduce the, um, the, the lift for implementation for and, and deployment. 
uh, we will uh, push that at a later phase. Um, uh, any ancillary services transfers, bucket one transfers that are declared here for the purpose of the resource efficiency evaluation, we need to reserve the transmission capacity in IFM and not optimize it because we don't optimize the ancillary services, so we need to keep those fixed. And the way to do that is to essentially um, um, make sure that IFM does not re-optimize those transfers. Another example, of, and we uh, also uh, presented and discussed that is if you're using uh, the bucket one transfer uh, for energy and you associate it with a transmission contract and the participant exercises the transmission contract with sub schedules, then you can also self schedule the, the, the energy transfer system resources, those EPSR resources that I mentioned earlier that define the transfer. And then obviously, because these are self scheduled, the uh, IFM uh, will not uh, re-optimize this, we'll, we'll keep them fixed. So essentially the transmission capacity that is uh, released as bucket one here for the RSC purposes will stay put in IFM, we will not re-optimize it. So we have all these options, but they're not in, uh, open in the sense that we have a choice um, that you know I release uh, this um, and I declare this bucket one transmission and it is my choice to uh, have it optimizable or not optimizable in IFM. The default is it will be optimizable, as we always said here. We use it in RSC, but then it's, it's optimized in IFM, and there are only these two scenarios, very specific scenarios, that we will not optimize it. So I just want to make it clear here. Thank you. Thanks, George. I. I um... That's a lot to digest, and I, I don't know that we're, if, if what you're referring to is exactly what I was trying to get at. I think what I was trying to get at was more of just a straightforward high level comment around what the scenarios are, one of them being transfers that happen to be at an interface between two EDAM entities, similar to this illustration that we're looking at except that it's related to a contract that is not available to be optimized through the market for whatever reason. And I think supporting that is yeah. important uh, somehow. Yeah, no, I, I got it, Jeff. Let me, let me see if I can just get a clarification from George. George, you know, could a party ultimately, even though they're bringing in bucket one transmission with them, could they choose to self-schedule Essentially, that transaction to to limit optimization. You know, let's say it's a legacy contract, pre-tariff, pre-out, that has certain limitations. It could support that generation, but for some reason, whatever the limitation may be, it, it you know it's not optimizable in another way. Could that transaction be self-scheduled in some way to to avoid that optimization potentially? Yes, Milos, as I said, if it is a transmission contract, and then the transfer is associated with a contract reference number, it's part of the contract path for that transmission contract. And then in this particular scenario, yes, we will support the participant who releases this transmission to actually self-schedule it so that we don't optimize it in the IFM. But this is the narrow scenario that this represents a contract. In the general case, you know, that uh, transmission is released as bucket one, um, that will be re-optimized in IFM as it should because we want to make the best use of transmission in, in the IFM. So this is just the exception scenario that, you know, this represents a specific contract that has physical and or uh, financial rights and, and the contract owner exercises the right by self-scheduling it in in, in the market, and therefore we'll use it like that also in uh, in the RSC, and we will not optimize that transmission in the ISM. All right, thanks, George. Hopefully, Jeff, that that provides a bit of clarity. I think there's room here to to you know, account for some of these unique arrangements that may be whether whether it's pre out or, or otherwise, but that for some reason the transmission can't be optimized. Sounds like. You know, we can still support that generation being used to demonstrate sufficiency, but there's a way here that we can avoid optimization of that transmission further. And Milos, that's all the questions we have at this time. Okay. Well, let's let's see if we can 
you know, what I'll do next is, is on this slide, we'll talk a little bit about numbers, just to further capture this concept of what amount of transmission is being brought under bucket one to support a resource efficiency demonstration. And then on the next slide, slide seven, we'll look and see if we can apply the discussion that we had here over the last few slides in a more complex graphic uh, that, that, that's among EDAM BAs, and I'll walk through it just to make sure that, that we can, I guess, visualize the concept of, of bucket one transmission being made available uh, to support transfers. So in this example, this is a bit of a number example, but again, just to illustrate in the context of resource efficiency, how much bucket one transmission, what, what role does bucket one transmission play? And so uh, putting numbers to it, EDAM entity, they have a resource efficiency obligation you know, for a particular time frame. let's say it's 5,000 megawatts. And based on the different offers into the market, uh, there's 4,500 megawatts of generation that's internal to that balancing authority area that's being used to demonstrate that sufficiency. And then 500 megawatts is from uh, generation outside of that particular EDAM balancing authority area. Uh, and, and out of those 500, that's generation outside of the balancing authority area, you know, 200 megawatts is from generation that, that, is, a, that is delivered across transfer points or interface points with another EDAM balancing authority area. And then 300 megawatts is, is across the intertidal interface with a non EDAM balancing authority area. And so the bucket one transmission ultimately that would be coming along with this particular entity that they'd be bringing to the table to support those EDAM transfers is really associated with, you know, these 200 megawatts um, uh, that, that is tied to bringing in generation from an adjacent or, or another ba EDAM balancing authority area um, where they can bring in that transfer capability across those EDAM BAs that can be optimized by the market. All this to illustrate just the congruence between the resource efficiency evaluation and bucket one transmission. Um, you know, uh, when an entity is demonstrating resource efficiency, it doesn't mean that they're bringing in the full, you know, in this case, it doesn't mean that they're bringing in 5,000 megawatts of, of bucket one transfers. Really within the context of the resource efficiency evaluation, they're bringing in as much transmission at those uh, transfer points across EMBAs as much as they're relying upon uh, resources from those other EDAM entity areas to meet their resource efficiency. So in this case, while the resource efficiency obligation is 5,000 megawatts, for that particular time frame, they're really using 200 megawatts or demonstrating 200 megawatts from generation in another EDAM balancing authority area that's adjacent. And then the trans bucket one transmission that's associated with that is you know, is associated with those 200 megawatts across those transfer points between those EDAM entity areas that can be then further optimized by the market. And I think, you know, on a side note, I think this illustrates then as well the, the, the value and the need for additional transmission in order for the EDAM to derive those greater benefits. You know, I think that's where bucket two transmission comes in when parties are bringing in additional transmission available to further optimize those transfers uh, and then bucket three transmission that we'll talk a bit later. Uh, but you know, I, I want to make sure that, that there's not this perception here that if, if whatever the resource efficiency obligation amount is, that that's the amount of transmission, bucket one transmission that needs to be brought uh, you know, to the table. It's really that associated with how much are you relying on, on uh, generation that's located in another EDAM balancing authority area that adjacent to you, uh, you know, that, that you can optimize those transfers then uh, between those uh, two EDAM balancing authority areas or multiple balancing authority areas. So, so I can pause here then as well for questions before then we get into the, the next slide is kind of the last slide I had on, on bucket one that kind of illustrates you know, some, you know, everything that we talked about thus far and, and adds a bit more complexity to it, but all in order to illustrate, you know, the transmission that parties are bringing to the table here on the various contracts to support bucket one uh, transfers. Okay. Operator, could you open up the line for Callie Wells? Sure. Please go ahead, the line is unmuted. Hi, it's Callie Wells with WPTF. I just have a very simple clarifying question. 
Um, so since the RSC can vary by hour, um, to the extent the reliance on a generator in another EDMBA um, changes also hourly, do you anticipate these transmission, bucket one transmission designations to vary as well? Um, and if so, what, have you thought about the mechanisms that they would do that? Is that, you know, I know all these are gonna be stored in master file, but obviously that doesn't allow for hourly fluctuations. So is this gonna be a, a bid parameter or a bidding feature? Yeah, yeah, and, and George, feel free to jump in if you want as well. But yeah, th there will be the ability here, you know, as you're varying your resources that as well, you're demonstrating or that may vary across the 24 hour horizon to meet the sufficiency uh, on that hourly basis. There will be also the ability to vary that. You know, that impacts obviously the transmission that's brought uh, under bucket one. Now, in terms of the mechanism, um, how this is demonstrated, I think we can talk about it as well in the context of, of um, or, or how transmission is is ultimately made available. I think we can talk about that also at, at the upcoming discussion in the context of bucket two, because I think you know the, it relates to both of these. But I think we we recognize that. You know, there's there's obviously long-term transmission rights that are that are made available that are fairly static across the longer-term horizon, and then you've got the shorter-term transmission rights that you know maybe on a daily basis and vary um, on a shorter-term time frame. And we're looking at as well as you know the systems and the mechanisms to allow for that, you know, bringing in that uh, dynamic transmission across you know different time time horizons as well. Uh, so, so we'll we'll tee that up as well at, at the at the next discussion in the context of bucket two, but I, I you know I think there's a role as, to play here as well for the EDAM entity or or its transmission provider function one of the two, um, you know we need some way to know that the transmission rights that are being made available uh, to support bucket one transfers, you know that those have been verified that those are transmission rights that uh, you know the the, the that an entity actually holds, and it's not just anybody, you know, putting in any kind of a number. But uh, so the process will need to allow for some verification that the transmission that's being made available to support these transfers, whether it's bucket one or bucket two, um, has been verified. And, and I think there's a as part of that overall process of how this is notified to the market. I think there's a role there to play as well for the for the EM entity who could to do some of those verifications and ultimately identify that transmission that's made available. But George, let me let me see if you wanted to add anything to this as well. George, you're double muted. There you go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we're talking about the mechanics of how this is gonna be um, uh, coming in. Uh, so we, we do have, um, uh, mechanism today to accept bids uh, and to, regarding transfer declaration. Of course, we want this bucket one transfers to be declared before 9 a.m. as we said earlier. So we're, the way I I see this uh, coming into the system is through cyber. So you declare those, uh, the EDAM entity could declare those uh, those transfers or the participant who releases the, the transmission capacity will declare it. Uh, simply by, let's say, uh, submitting information for the ETSR on these transfers, which will be, uh, we'll, we'll say how much the scheduling limit that the market and the RSC will use, and the scheduling limit says how much uh, capacity is released on that transfer. So we'll use that in the RSC as being the um, the megawatt value of that uh, particular bucket one transfer that we'll use in the RSC, and we'll also use the same number for bucket three and bucket two transmission that is released for the IFM. So that's that will be the mechanism. But these are implementation details. Essentially, it will provide the mechanism for participants to uh, declare this information submitted uh, along with their bids. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to confirm that the, the numbers that you use can vary each hour depending on what RSE obligations are per hour. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, got it. Yeah. The bits in the, yeah, the bits in the day head market, they have, uh, you know, uh, they can vary by hour. So this information, uh, specifically the scheduling limit for a transfer can also vary by hour. Okay, great. Um, operator, could you open the line for Doug Bocignoni? Sure. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. 
Hi, Doug Bocignone for the Bay Area Municipal Transmission Group. I'm thinking the way you're describing the the bucket one in the context of the RSE is, you know, only at the inner ties between the the EDAM BAAs or non EDAM and the EDAM BAA. But it, it it seems to me that the you know thinking back to the earlier discussion uh, from the Nevada Commission about the the bucket one transmission and you know what quantities should be considered bucket one. I mean, it isn't that transmission support. It isn't just the intertie transmission. I mean, it's supported by internal transmission within the each BAA. Um, so I'm sort of trying to wrap my mind around when when we're saying, you know, that transmission is made available to the EDAM, I, I get that, you know, for the transfer that there's some quantity that's being made available to the EDAM, but within each EDAM BAA, the transmission is also being made available. Mm -hmm. is, that's right. Is that right? And, that's and right, for the, Doug. yeah, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. And and for the CAISO, within the CAISO, is it any different from the other BAAs in this sense? I mean, is is all of the CAISO transmission going to be considered bucket one unless there's some kind of ETC related to it? Yeah, thanks, Doug, for the question. So, so let, let me take the first one and then you know, if we could, you know, defer discussion on, on um, how CAISO's transmission fits into these buckets because it's, you know, for, for that discussion, you know, there needs to be a little bit of, uh, there are different concepts here. In, in this bilateral world, there's, a, there's an easy way to, or easier way to track with that transmission and how the transmission is made available based on reservations. You know, we're not in a reservation-based system at this stage, we're not an extensive reservation-based system, but so, so there's some nuances that we'll need to consider within the context of how does ISO transmission and what is bucket one transmission in the context of the ISO versus bucket two versus bucket three. I, I'd like to defer that discussion for a little bit later. We'll have that discussion in a couple of meetings. Uh, but on, on your first question of, uh, of, of internal transmission being made available, yeah, we make that assumption. There'll be, I guess, a, a discussion here if not the next meeting, the meeting after on just on how internal transmission is being utilized and optimized to support uh, EDAM overall. But yeah, the assumption is at this stage that, that internal transmission is made available to the EDAM similar to, to the EIM to support uh, to support transactions. And, and George, let me you know, see if you wanna add anything at this stage without necessarily you know getting into, into the entire discussion of internal transmission at this stage, but See if you want to supplement anything on, on Doug's question. Uh, yes, Milos. Uh, essentially, what I have said in the past that uh, we always assume in the market that internal transmission to the BA is available, um, and uh, we assume that when bids are submitted or when transfers are declared, that the internal transmission uh, to its BAA to to get to the border for the transfer. Is, is available. We make that implicit assumption. Uh, so we, we we don't have a way to um, to to check or even have uh, explicit representation of internal transmission availability within a BA. We always assume it's available if if a bid is submitted for it. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. I, I think that does have ramifications for the the earlier discussion about you know. How you define the quantity of the bucket one transmission, and and you know whether it's limited based on the particular forecast of load for a particular day or for the for the month or some longer period of time. Yeah, and you're talking, Doug. You're talking about particularly transmission associated with designated resources. Is that what you're yeah. referring to? Yeah. Well, I network. Yeah, yeah, network integration transmission. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah I and, I, and I guess what I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, particularly if 
if the parties have rights to, you know, pick and choose, which, you know, to essentially transfer that, it seems like, you know, that, yeah, you know, the, the transmission provider is, is, has already sort of committed that transmission and it may be a, a broader uh, array of transmission than just a particular source and the particular sink, right? Yeah, and, and if, I, if I'm tracking, I mean, keep, keep in mind in the context of the resource efficiency evaluation, you know, the, the, the EDAM entity you know, would, would also be demonstrating internal resources for that uh, sufficiency evaluation. So in the context of network integration transmission service, you know, there would be, I anticipate they would be you know, demonstrating or offering in um, designated network resources. Uh, and, and, and that may vary, as you said, by hour based upon the load, but you know, other factors that dictate what the resource efficiency obligation is, um, you know, across that 24 hour horizon, but you would envision that at least some portion, if not all of the portion of their load, you know, the, the, there would be also some internal designated network resources to the extent that they have any, uh, you know, that could be utilized to support that sufficiency demonstration. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what we're talking with bucket one is, is those, you know, those resources in the context, again, if we're just focusing on NITs, is, is those designated resources that may be outside of that EDAM entity area that they're bringing in, a, you know, across another adjacent EDAM balancing authority area. And if you're doing that, then you're bringing in as well that transmission of that interface uh, that can be optimized as a bucket one transfer to that, you know, derives the benefits under bucket one. And that's where, you know, as I was highlighting here is that may be a fraction, you know, of your resource efficiency evaluation. In this case, you know, 200 megawatts of your full 5,000 megawatts resource uh, sufficiency obligation, 200 megawatts of transmission is being brought as, as bucket one, because you're relying on 200 megawatts on resources in the adjacent balancing authority EDAM and entity area to meet that. Um, but that's where the, the value of some of the additional buckets comes in uh, to increase that transmission to optimize further those transfers. Thank you. Okay. All right, Miglesh, we don't have any more questions at this point in time if you'd like to move on. Okay. So let's see if we can apply, uh, you know, what we talked about here in, in a slightly more complex example, and I'll walk you through it, but just, just to illustrate again, the, the intent here is not to illustrate optimization, anything like that. This is just trying to track what transmission across what transfer points our parties bringing to the table um, as bucket one transmission. And just an illustration to, to capture the different types of arrangements. So we've got three different EDAM entities here. All three are EDAM entities. They're, they're adjacent to each other. Uh, um, and there's different generators and different loads. But for EDAM entity one, so this is the EDAM entity one, and they're relying on the generator in the adjacent EDAM entity two, they're relying on generation from EDAM entity two to meet their resource efficiency evaluation. So for resource efficiency evaluation purposes, you would expect to see you know, them relying on, on G2 and that generator has transmission rights uh, to deliver that to, to, to the load in, in entity one. So what entity one then in the context of this example would be expected to bring to the table is the transmission associated with this generator two. And, and across this transfer point, they're bringing in the transmission across this interface point between EDAM entity one and EDAM entity two. Um, you know, we talked about in prior examples, this could be the point to point leg, this could be the, 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 the NITS leg or a point to point leg, but the idea is there's you know, a certain amount of megawatts that they're bringing in across this transfer point as bucket one transmission that then the market could use to optimize EDAM transfers. EDAM entity two, these folks are relying on, gener to meet their resource efficiency evaluation, they're relying on a generator in EDAM entity one that has transmission rights here. And so they're bringing with them, EDAM entity two is bringing with them additional transfer capability or, or a, a, this interface between EDAM entity one and EDAM entity two. 
So this increases, again, the, the bucket overall transmission that's available to the EDAM at this interface between EDAM Entity 1 and EDAM Entity 2, because they're bringing in this generator uh, to serve, you know, to meet their obligations here for Entity 2. Entity 2 is also bringing to the table interface or bucket 1 transmission across Entity 2 and Entity 3, because they're bringing in generator, uh, generator 3 is being shown for sufficiency, and so they've got transmission of a certain quality that we talked about before, that firm, conditional firm, or you know, this concept of otherwise highly reliable, but they're bringing in transmission for resource sufficiency on this interface between Entity 2 and Entity 3. And that's, again, because they're showing G3, or this generator that's located in Entity 3, they're relying on generation from this entity just to meet their resource sufficiency obligation. So their Entity 2 then is bringing to the table both transfer capability between Entity 1 and Entity 2 at this point, because they're using the generator, and they're bringing in transfer capability at this between Entity 2 and Entity 3 because they're relying on a generator in Entity 3, 3's area uh, uh, for resource sufficiency. That's bucket one. And then we get to EDAM Entity 3. There, for their resource sufficiency evaluation, let's say they're, um, they're relying on a generator that's a couple of balancing authority areas away, on this generator one in EDAM Entity 1. That generator, you know, they've got a trans or, or that entity now, there's transmission across this interface that they've reserved because they have to bring the generator one to the interface and then you have to reserve transmission across entity two. So entity three is bringing in additional transfer capability here at between entity one and entity two that we would expect to be declared as bucket one transmission. And, you know, that generation is being wheeled across entity two and so they're bringing in, you know, additional transfer capability between EDAM Entity 2 and EDAM Entity 3 as well to the table. So Entity 3 is bringing bucket 1 transmission of both this interface and at this interface because they're relying on a generator that, you know, is a couple of balancing authority areas away, and they're wheeling through an EDAM uh, Entity 2 area. So they're touching both of these points here at the, at the interface and they're bringing that bucket one transmission to the table. That's all I'm trying to illustrate here. I'm not trying to illustrate anything, how the market optimizes, you know, congestion allocations. I'm just trying to illustrate here what transmission is somebody bringing to the table under bucket one. And it all, as it goes back to what generation are you relying upon to meet your resource efficiency uh, evaluation? And if you're relying on generation that's in another, uh, EDAM balancing authority area that's adjacent to you, or in this case, you know, you're wheeling through multi multiple areas. You're bringing in that transmission at those interfaces, and that's bucket one transmission. We talked about that that could be derived through, you know, point-to-point -point rights. You know, you know, somebody could have a point-to-point -point right from generator one to this interface here, and then point-to-point -point to wheel through EDAM entity two. Uh, but ultimately, you're bringing in that interface uh, between those EDAM transfer points in between, between those EDAM uh, areas, that's bucket one transmission that's being brought to the table. And we talked about the quality of that transmission. And the quality of that transmission as a starting point that we talked about is firm, conditional firm, or this concept of otherwise highly reliable that I think we'll, we'll need to get into a bit more and, and what does that mean. But let me just pause here as well and see if kind of this further paints the picture and, and if there are any questions um, on what bucket one conceptually transmission is, is intended to be. Operator, can you open the line of Petr Rostonovic? Sure. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Um. Better? Actually, uh, your uh, your audio is breaking, Petter. So, um, can you please uh, reconnect? It's a distorted voice. We we can't hear you. Uh, you may need to reconnect. Okay. Yeah, still, yeah. Still. Um, Tom, Wu, 
Sure. Please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Tang Wu from Waha. Uh, I assume that these uh, uh, transfers in opposite direction do not connect to each other. So each connection transfer point actually represents two pipes, one in uh, left direction, the other one from the right direction. They don't mean both together. Can you confirm that or uh, misunderstood? Yeah, let me see. Let me see if I understood the question and correct me if I'm wrong. But it sounds like you're asking, you know, once once you define the amount of megawatts that ultimately is brought here, you know, let's say among all of these transactions, you know, the different parties and different entities are bringing together, let's say, 200 megawatts. You're asking, you know, that those transfers can be optimized in both directions, to, you know, to support transfers across, you know, from EDM entity three into EDM entity two, and from EDM entity two to EDM entity three. And if that's the question. That's correct. Yeah. It, it, ultimately, what we're deriving is how much, you know, megawatts um, uh, are here available for transfer between these two areas. And, you know, the market can, in its optimization, it could you know, choose to optimize resources to go from, you know, you know maybe three to two and, and vice versa. But uh, was that the question, Tonk? Uh, no, uh, I wasn't talking about optimization. I was just talking about usage of transmission capacity. Let me give you an example. Let's say here you have G1 um, from entity one going through entity two and then uh, meet L1's uh, RSE requirement. So that's the purple line there going through the bubble that, or the transfer point between entity two and entity three, okay? And at the same time you have the uh, uh, green line going from G3 to L2, okay? They're in the opposite direction. Uh, if G1 and L1 brings in, say, uh, 50 megawatt, and then you have uh, G3 to L2, let's say, um, uh, 10 megawatt, right, in the opposite direction, does that create room on the transmission for G1 to L1? Or in, you know, or vice versa, because flows net each other. If you run power flow, it will net each other. But in this RSE assessment, do you consider that netting, or you do not consider that netting? In in, in other words, these purple lines and green lines, do they go through different pipes? Actually, they going do they go through different points? Although you show uh, on the picture as one point there, but do, conceptually, are there actually two points, one in the, this direction, the other in the other direction, they cannot net each other, or do you allow them to net yeah. each other? Good question. Let me see, you know, I don't know, George, if you have any, any thoughts on that. The way I was thinking about it is additional transfer capability um, across that, and let's assume, you know, it's a particular point here, you know, Define the name, but they're going across the same tie point, and transmission rights are across the same tie point. Any thoughts, George, on, on maybe how we've thought about this before, or others as well? You know, do these net each other, or is this kind of incremental transmission? Those are, you know, all of a sudden you have 60 megawatts of transmission rights, um, or if they're netted in that example of, uh, across each other. Um, yes, Melis, thank you. Uh, this is Sergeant Galevis. Um, so the transfer concept and the way we model it, uh, same as in EIM, is in a given direction. So there is transmission capacity that's made available on an intertie and it's made available in either direction. But when we define transfers, we define them in a certain direction. So you could have a transfer going from left to right and another transfer going from right to left. And uh, in, uh, in the market, of course, we optimize those, so it's very unlikely that we'll see schedule in both directions. It's always going to be in one direction. So one transfer is used, the other is not. Now, for the resource efficiency evaluation, of course, we're not doing any kind of optimization. We're not calculating any schedules. We simply use the declared bucket one transfer capacity, whatever is declared as the scheduling limit, to transfer requirements. So it's not really an issue of whether they they counterflowed on each other, they cancel each other. 
we see them as independent scheduling instruments uh, for the purpose of the resource efficiency evaluation. And yes, if, if they're at the same value, uh, left to right and right to left, what will happen is when we transfer the requirements for each one independently, I guess they cancel out. So if this is possible to have such an inefficient outcome. It doesn't hurt our model here and how we perform the resource efficiency evaluation. It doesn't make much sense, but it also doesn't hurt. In essence, what I'm trying to say is that we don't care um, how this optimization will take place in IFM later. And for the resource efficiency evaluation, all we need to uh, pay attention to is which bucket one transfers are declared from which BAA to what BAA uh, and uh, for what amount. And then we take that information and perform the RSC. Then what the market is going to do, optimize them, that comes next. So in other words, George, for uh, the bucket one RSC test, we do not net across the transfer points, but when we get into IFM and we actually run the market, everything will be optimized. Is that what you're saying? Um, I said it in a little different way, uh, Debbie, because essentially we perform the transfer of the requirement for the RSC purposes on a, on a bucket one by bucket one basis. So let's say we have a transfer here, a bucket one transfer going from entity one to entity two, all right? Okay, we'll take, let's say it's 400 megawatts. So we'll take 100 megawatts of, of uh, let's say it's an energy transfer. We'll take 100 megawatts of the demand forecast for entity two and we'll transfer it to entity one. Let's say that there is also another transfer declared, another bucket one transfer, also 100 megawatts from entity two to entity one. Well, again, we transfer 100 megawatts of demand forecast from entity one to entity two. What happened in this uh, um, combined, uh, what's the combined effect? We actually canceled out the two transfers. But it doesn't matter for the RSC, we don't even pay attention to that. Whatever it's declared, we use it. If it's an inefficient outcome or we have to transfer something and transfer it back, it doesn't hurt us. We'll do it anyway. Okay. All right, we've got um, Petr Rostanovic back on the line. And if you could state your name and uh, who you're working for. Sure. Um, please go ahead, Elaine is unmuted. Is it better now, Debbie? Yes, it is, thank you. George, this is a very nice picture. Let's talk more what we started yesterday. I hope we have more time now. So let's assume that entity three is getting RSC from entity one, 100 megawatt, and there is 100 megawatt ETSR from entity one to entity two, and 100 megawatt ETSR from entity two to entity three. And you transfer RSC from entity one to entity three by putting 100 megawatt load on entity one and 100 megawatt load less on entity three. How do you make sure that ETSR between entity one and entity two is not used again. And the same question, if you have five entities between entity one and entity three. My point is that to make sure that you are not double counting ETSRs, you have to count every leg around the path that is kind of transferring RSC from entity one to any other remote one. Right, Peter, I, I wanted to provide this answer yesterday and we ran out of time. So essentially what happens here is we don't need to know how to connect all the points. We do this transfer on a bucket one by bucket one independently, right? So I, I don't need to know that uh, this transfer from entity one to entity two is actually linked in some way with the transfer from entity two to entity three because I'll handle them and I'll process them independently. So I process one transfer, transfer the requirement, then another transfer, transfer the requirement accordingly, and then at the end I perform the RSC for each BAA. So it's, uh, you can say you can apply the concept of superposition here. So there are independent actions at the BAA level. I don't need to know how to link them across BAA. So it's a much simpler uh, model this way because it can be performed for each BAA even independently. That's what we want. We want to have a resource efficiency evaluation that can be executed on demand for a given BAA. So George, so, if, you, if you have 
entity one providing another 100 megawatt to entity two, how do you know that the same ETSR is not used for the, 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 the transfer? Let's say ETSR is 100. How do we make sure that 200 is not going to 100? Because the TTSR is used once in this process. So I'll take the transfer from entity one to entity two, and I'm gonna transfer requirements from entity two to entity one. Then I'm gonna take the transfer from entity two to entity three, and I'm gonna transfer requirements from entity three to entity two. Okay, okay. That's, that's, that's okay. I understand what you're saying, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, um, operator, can you open the line for Doug Bocignoni? Sure. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Uh, Doug Bocignone for the Bay Area Municipal Transmission Group. So with the concept of the, the bucket one uh, transfers being directional, um, sort of suggests then that the, the ca capability in the opposite direction sort of necessarily would end up needing to be in some other bucket. Is that right? Either bucket two or bucket three? George, you did you? Go ahead, George. Uh, go ahead. Okay, I mean, these examples are strictly referring to bucket one transmission in association with the resource efficiency evaluation. Of course, there could be declarations of bucket two and bucket three, but these are not relevant for the RSC. We use this in the market, in IFM. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the question is about. Uh, I, I'm just trying to step back a bit. And if you start thinking of this as, if you're limiting it, and maybe it's only for the RSC portion of the bucket one transmission, that it be directional, but um, it suggests to me that then the, you know, that you'd want to recognize the the ability for power to flow the opposite way and need to account for it somehow. You know, either as yeah. e either bucket one could be bidirectional if it wasn't associated with the RSC, or it then becomes some other bucket category of transmission? Um, well, okay, I, again, it's like, we're only talking about bucket one here and how they're used in the RSC, and as I explained to, to Peter earlier, we handle it one at a time, it's transfer at a time. Like you could have transfers in either direction, but it doesn't matter, it's a superposition problem. Essentially, we handle it's transfer at a time, and at the end, we have all we need to perform the RSC for its BAA. Um, now, after that, when we go to the market, all of this transmission capacity uh, under bucket one, plus the additional transmission capacity that is released under bucket two and bucket three becomes available for optimizing all the commodities, again, with the exception of ancillary services for day one. And then it's, you have an, an efficient outcome where, you know, uh, potentially uh, schedules uh, are canceling out across the same intertie. At the end, you have a, a transfer being scheduled in one direction. It, it, you won't have transfer scheduled in, in the opposite direction as well. That's the efficient outcome of the market. So you maybe have transfers, bucket one transfers declared here, both from one to two and from two to one, and we'll use them as they're declared for the resource efficiency evaluation of BAH one and two, but then the market will optimize that and maybe the optimal schedule will be from one to two. You won't have energy transfer schedule from two to one because it won't be efficient. You always have transfer scheduled in the direction from, uh, from a low price PAA to a high price PAA, right? That's the efficient outcome. That's what you will see in the market. But here, it's a resource efficiency evaluation. We're not running the market yet. So whatever is declared, we'll use it for the RSC. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, operator, can you open up the line for Jeff Nelson? Sure. Please go ahead, the line is unmuted. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Jeff Nelson, SCE. Uh, so this, this has to do with uh, sort of bi-directional versus unidirectional, sort of like Tong's question. Uh, 
here we've got like entity one and entity two. I just want to look at those two circles. And you've got sort of a purple line that's going from entity one to entity two. And then you've got sort of a, I don't know what color that is, gold, orange line going from entity two to entity one. So you've got sort of bi-directional interface there. A portion's going into entity two, a portion's going into entity one. If we could just pretend the gold orange lines didn't exist. So there was just a line from G1 to L2, uh, a flow from entity one to entity two. The question is, what gets turned over to the EDAM for optimization? Do, is a bi-directional transmission turned over so you could have flows from entity one to two or entity two to one? Or is what's only turned over to the EIM as, as bucket one or EDAM as bucket one, a unidirectional flow? Or put another way, once an interface is turned over as bucket one, is it always bi-directional or do each directions have to be turned over independently? Hope that question uh, makes that, sense. Yeah, each direction is independent, right? As I said, we define the transfers in a given direction. Uh, so uh, if you have, uh, you know, uh, bucket one transfer here from entity one to entity two, we use that for the resource efficiency evaluation, and then this transmission capacity is released. But then there is also bucket two transfer from one to two, and bucket two transfer from two to one, which are not bucket one, so we didn't use them, but the FM will use them. Okay, so so we should be thinking of these interfaces as as two independent you know, uh, uh, directional paths. You, you got to turn, if it's going to be an EDAM, only the directions that are turned over to EDAM go into the optimization. Directions that are not turned over to EDAM stay out of the optimization. Exactly. I mean, the okay. example that okay. I could give you in IAM is what Pacific Corp has between Pacific Corp East and Pacific Corp West. I believe the transfer between Pacific Corp West to Pacific Corp East is defined in the direction from west to east. The east to west transfer normally has, or it used to have, you know, back then when we started EIM, a zero scheduling limit. So there is, that's, that's an example, but transfers are defined in either direction, but they have different scheduling limits depending on the rights that are, um, um, are used to release the transmission capacity. So in this particular case, I believe the, remember from the old days in 2014, the right was only from, uh, Pacific had only rights from west to east, and that's why the transfer from east to west has a zero scheduling limit normally. Now, I don't know how's the situation now, but I'm just bringing this as an example. The transfers are defined in a certain direction uh, because the rights and the transmission capacity that is released in that direction may not be the same as the one in the other direction, but we expect if transmission capacity is released for efficiency purposes to have to, to have that released in both directions so that the optimization will find a better use of it. Some hours of the day, maybe it will be going from east to west. Some other, other hours of the day it may end up being going from west to east, depending on how the, the bids are and how we optimize all the commodities, right? Sure, so so I mean, this 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 diagram has directions going both ways, so it wasn't quite clear. Uh, if, if I could go back to just the diagram and let, let's put all the colors back in, and let's assume that uh, entity one to entity two, L2, they're, they're, that's sort of the, the native balancing authorities load and it's, it's getting generation over its own unidirectional transmission right. But that balancing authority, and people can correct me if this is wrong, they're bringing power into their balancing authority but they still, as my understanding, have the ability to sell the export direction of their transmission. They might even be able to sell it twice, depending on what their flow is coming in. Uh, if they've sold that to a third party, that sort of export from entity two to entity one, which I guess is shown in the gold, uh, unless the person that's, that's bought that contract turns it over as bucket two, that won't be part of the EDAM optimization right, the direction from two to one because it's been sold to a third party. Uh, if the direction two to one is sold to a third party and that party does not release the transmission, then it won't be available in the IFM to optimize it. 
Okay, but if they turn it over as bucket two, it will be. Oh yeah, you bet. Okay. Okay, I get it. I get all the pictures. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, clarification for me. Oh. Sorry for taking time. Thank you. No problem. All right, operator, could you open up the line for Kelly Wells, please? Sure. Please go ahead. The line is unmuted. Hey, George. It's Kelly Wells with WTTF again. Um, so I am have a question kind of along the same lines, but I'm trying to connect it back to the examples that we went over the last couple working groups and and maybe I'm making maybe I shouldn't be making this connection um, so feel free to let me know but in the congestion run examples when you had kind of transfers between two BAAs um, it showed taking setting the total transfer capability between those two BAAs as the minimum of what both sides brought to the table so when you have this example here Let's assume all this is the only transmission that's made available, and you have, let's just say, 100 megawatts from entity one to entity two, and 50 megawatts from entity two to entity one. What is the market going to see? Is it going to see 100 in one direction and 50 in the other? Or, and if so, then how do I connect that back to the congestion rent examples where it took the minimum of the two when it set the capacity or the transfer um, amount that was available to the market. Hmm. Okay. And again, if I'm uh, making good. this correct, if I'm trying to make a connection that I should not be, just let me, feel free to let me know. No, actually, it's a good question because I have to clarify that these are two different things you're talking about, all right? So one uh, thing is how the parties on each side of a transfer, and again, the transfer is in a certain direction. So let's say there is a transfer that is, um, let's say it's a bucket two transfer from uh, one to two. There are parties, there are transmission parts on either side of the transfer that release transfer capacity. To effectuate the transfer and model it in our systems, of course we have to take the lower uh, amount of transmission capacity that is released from either party. So if one party, let's say entity one, releases 100 megawatt of transmission for bucket two, and entity two releases 100 megawatt of transmission, uh, sorry, 50 megawatts of transmission uh, under bucket two, and this transmission is going from one to two, okay? It's a specific transfer from one to two. And we can only model this transfer for 50 megawatts because, you know, it's the lower amount of transmission capacity that is released by both parties, right? So that defines the transfer from one to two for 50 megawatts. Now, there is a similar process for defining a transfer from two to one, okay? So maybe from two to one, entity two releases 70 megawatts, and entity one releases 60 megawatts. Then we'll define a transfer from two to one for 60 megawatts, which is the lower of the two. And that one is going from two to one. That's a different transfer in the opposite direction. Now, for bucket one specifically, this represents some contractual agreements between entities in these BAAs. So, of course, we expect that the contract will have the same amount of megawatts going through. So, it doesn't matter for, for us as a market operator. We'll take whatever is defined and declared and registered by the entity. So, if the entity registers 100 megawatts of that bucket, one transfer from one to two, we'll say, thank you, we'll take it and we'll use it. All right? And then in the onboarding process, we'll make sure that it's understood that if transmission capacity is released for a given transfer at different amounts left and right, we'll take the lower uh, amount to, to define that transfer. And then the way we do it in EIM, we have one of the entities, one of the entities, the EIM entities, I'm speaking specifically for EIM, having the responsibility to tell the market operator what is the scheduling limit. So we're not after we define the transfer for the maximum amount of transmission capacity that it can have, in any given interval in real-time market, so here will be the same for an hour in the day-ahead market, one entity of the two that are involved in the transfer has the responsibility to tell the market operator what's the scheduling limit that will be used in the market. And we go by that. And we can use the same mechanism here. We can have either entity one or entity two assume that responsibility to specify with the market operator what is the scheduling limit that will be used in the RSC for a bucket one and in the market for all the buckets, and we'll use that limit, which could vary by hour. 
Okay, I think that helps. So the step where you take the minimum of what was provided will happen first before the RSC transfer, but your assumption is because it's transmission supporting an RSC, the values on both sides should be the same. That would be my assumption. Okay. Okay, thank you. I was trying to make that connection, but that helped um, that the, what was in the congestion run example happens first before this. So thank you. Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, um, we've run out of time again. Um, we'll go ahead on Thursday and continue with bucket three and then go on to examples for bucket two and to the extent possible, um, start the discussion on the internal transmission. So thank you everyone for your participation today. Um, really appreciate the discussion and we'll talk to everybody on Thursday. Have a great day. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.